story recapped here. Today I'm gonna explain a horror and thriller film called Texas Chainsaw 3D. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. In 1974, a chainsaw-wielding killer murdered a group of friends. However, one of them, Sally, luckily survived after escaping in the back of a passing pickup truck. It wasn't long before Sally gave a statement to the police, so they took immediate action. Sheriff Hooper then led his team to the house of the Sawyers, the killer's family. As the sheriff takes out his gun, he shouts for Drayton Sawyer to surrender his son, Jed, or Leatherface, the one who committed all the killings. Although Drayton argued that Jed was merely protecting their family, the sheriff said that wasn't what it seemed like to Sally. The Sawyers were ready to fight against the cops for their family, until they all decided just to give up Jed. But the townsfolk led by Mayor Burt suddenly arrived, ready to kill the entire Sawyer family. The mayor told the sheriff that they were there to back him up, but Sheriff Hooper angrily tried to send them away, because the Sawyers were already surrendering Jed. However, as the Sawyers prepared for a peaceful negotiation, things took an unfortunate turn as Bert ordered Ollie to set the house on fire. As flames erupted within the household, a shootout started between the two groups. But the townspeople still wiped out the Sawyers. Sheriff Hooper wasn't happy with the conclusion, but it wasn't done yet. Later that night, the townspeople swept the area to see if they missed anything. Then, Gavin saw a wounded Loretta Sawyer carrying a baby, asking for help. He took the infant from Loretta before kicking her in the face to finish her off. And as Gavin went straight to his wife, Arlene, they decided to adopt the Sawyer child. Years into the present, the child that Arlene and Gavin adopted has now grown into a lovely woman, Heather. Back in her shabby apartment, she lives with her boyfriend, Ryan. The two are about to get intimate but stop when they hear someone ringing their doorbell. Ryan goes to check it and finds a letter addressed to Heather. The letter details the recent death of Verna Sawyer, alongside a will for Heather. This confuses her because she grew up thinking all her grandparents were already dead. Because of the revelation, Heather goes to confront her parents about it. The family argues as Gavin and Arlene reveal that Heather is adopted, but still won't tell her where she came from. So, Heather plans to pursue the clues on her own to find out who she is. As she goes back to the apartment, she starts packing for New Texas where her real family used to live. Heather and Ryan were supposed to go to New Orleans for a Halloween trip, along with their other friends, Nikki and Kenny. But much to Heather's surprise, they all agreed to come with her to Texas instead. On their way there, they stop over for gas during a rainy night. As they're about to leave, Kenny accidentally runs over Daryl, a hitchhiker who needs a ride home. He gives the group some money just so he could catch a ride, which makes them agree. Although they still plan to go to New Orleans, they're gonna stop by Texas for Heather's inheritance, which Daryl doesn't mind. After hours of driving, they finally arrive at the address where Heather meets Mr. Farnsworth, her grandmother's lawyer. He says Verna was a good woman, also adding that Heather isn't allowed to sell the house. Finally, Farnsworth gives Heather the keys to the place and the gate security pin, which is 0819 or August 19th. Before he leaves, Farnsworth gives Heather Verna's letter and his calling card. As the group enters the estate, they stare in awe at the grandiose mansion. Inside, they immediately start checking the rooms with much delight, wondering what Heather's grandmother did for a living to be so wealthy. However, out in the yard, Heather sees a more tragic side of her family's history as she stumbles upon the Sawyer graveyard, where she thanks her recently deceased grandmother for giving her the house. Heather returns to the house moments later, and after her friends mention several reasons why they should stay the night, she eventually agrees. They then decide to go to town to get some food, while Daryl chooses to stay behind to clean and look after the house. Unfortunately, Daryl has been pretending right from the beginning. As he's left alone, he starts stealing stuff right away and takes the house keys that Heather left. After ransacking the house, all that's left is the room for the biggest key, which Daryl starts looking for. It isn't long before Daryl stumbles upon a hidden entryway in the kitchen. That leads to a butler's pantry with a door to the basement. Happily sauntering down, he arrives at a big door that works with the key, thinking he might finally hit the jackpot. But instead, he comes into a regular wine cellar. Inspecting further, Daryl finds a metal door and tries to force it open, only to fail. He then looks for a tool to pry it open, 
but Leatherface suddenly shows up and bashes his head in until he dies. As it turns out, he survived the townspeople's attack years ago and has been hiding in the basement. On the other hand, in town, Nikki approaches Ryan and touches his manhood. He immediately tells her to stop, not wanting to be seen by anyone. It is then revealed that the two hooked up behind Heather's back after a rowdy night of drinks. Although Ryan thinks it's a mistake, Nikki doesn't share the same sentiment. Meanwhile, Heather meets Officer Carl, who asks if they're in town for the carnival, but she says she's in town for a housewarming. However, when Heather mentions inheriting the mansion, Mayor Burt comes up and sends Carl away so he could talk to her. After learning about the inheritance, Mayor Burt offers to buy the mansion from Heather, no matter how much it is, but she promptly declines before leaving. The group then returns to the mansion, where Heather realizes that Daryl has stolen from them. But still, that doesn't stop them from having a good time. After having a quick drink, everyone begins doing their own thing before dinner. Kenny starts cooking, Ryan goes to play billiards, and Nikki smokes outside while Heather wanders around the house. Heather sees the family portraits and notices a necklace worn by everyone. Then, as she inspects it further, she realizes it's identical to her supposed birthmark. Meanwhile, Kenny comes across the butler's pantry, which he announces to the group. However, before anyone could respond, he goes straight to the basement and sees blood on the floor. Assuming that Daryl is there, Kenny starts calling for him, but Leatherface suddenly shows up and chases him. Kenny tries to escape, but Leatherface hits him with his hook and mercilessly drags him downstairs. Unfortunately, Ryan doesn't hear Kenny's screams because of the loud music. On the other hand, Nikki frantically runs inside, urging Ryan to follow her. She then leads him to a barn, seemingly distraught by something she's seen. However, Nikki simply surprises Ryan with a bottle of tequila and starts undressing for him. In the house, Heather stumbles upon Verna's decomposing body in one of the rooms. Freaking out, she runs downstairs and shouts for her friends, but instead comes across Leatherface, who's wearing a human face for a mask. She sees Leatherface cutting off the fingers of a hand and tries to run away, but he grabs her and pushes her to the floor, causing her to hit her head on the table and pass out. Heather wakes up in the basement later, seeing Leatherface cutting up Daryl's body before impaling Kenny on a hook. Kenny, who's still alive, tries to fight back, but Leatherface cuts his body in half with a chainsaw. While Leatherface is preoccupied with Kenny, Heather takes her chance to run away. Unfortunately, he chases after her in the graveyard. Keeping her eyes on Leatherface while finding an escape route, Heather decides to hide in an open coffin. However, Leatherface locates her hiding spot and starts cutting into the coffin. Fortunately, Heather has enough space to move away from the chainsaw. Just in the nick of time, Ryan and Nikki emerge from the barn after hearing the commotion. They call out to Leatherface, but immediately run away when he starts coming after them. As Ryan tries to lock the barn, Leatherface Face tries to cut through the door using the chainsaw. Luckily, Nikki finds a shotgun and shoots through the wooden door, making Leatherface run away. Suddenly, a van bursts through the barn. Thankfully, it's just Heather who's come to rescue them. Ryan then takes the driver's seat, and they speed away from the mansion. However, since they're in a rush, the automatic gate doesn't open in time for them. Their van crashes into the gate and damages their engine, which stops them from driving away. Moments later, Leatherface catches up to them and cuts through the front tire. Still desperate to escape, Ryan tries driving away even with a damaged tire, which causes them to flip over. Ryan dies from the crash, but Heather and Nikki survive. Leatherface then starts attacking them, and although they try to move away from his attacks, Nikki still gets a few cuts. So, to save Nikki, Heather baits Leatherface into following her as she runs to the carnival. There, the people start running away in fear of the chainsaw-wielding man, alerting Carl, who's at the scene. Heather tries to escape Leatherface face by holding on to the ferris wheel, and as he waits for her to descend, Carl points his gun at him and orders him to put the chainsaw down. Refusing to get caught, Leatherface throws his chainsaw at Carl before fleeing. At the police department, Sheriff Hooper talks to Officer Marvin, who's at the crash site near the mansion. Although he sees the bloody mess, he doesn't see Nikki or Ryan's body. Instead, he finds a bloody trail that leads back to the estate. Meanwhile, Carl checks up on Heather, who's worried about Nikki. He then gives her a new shirt and reassures her that everything will be okay. 
Carl also brings her to Sheriff Hooper for a witness statement, and she reveals to him that she's a Sawyer. Realizing that they might be dealing with the same person responsible for the 1974 massacre, Sheriff Hooper talks to Mayor Burt and says it might be Jed Sawyer, also known as Leatherface. Although the mayor is in disbelief, knowing that they burned down the Sawyer's house to the ground, Sheriff Hooper doesn't want to dismiss the idea that Jed may have actually escaped. Then, they get a radio call from Marvin that he's going to follow the trail further into the mansion. Sheriff Hooper tries to stop him, but the mayor has different strategies that he wants Marvin to follow. The sheriff warns Marvin about the killer, but he arrogantly says that even with a chainsaw, the man isn't bulletproof. Meanwhile, Heather comes across the news clippings of the old Texas Chainsaw Massacre about the Sawyers, which happened on August 19th, alongside Sheriff Hooper's case report on the incident. On the other hand, Marvin continues to stake out the mansion while giving Sheriff Hooper and Bert a visual through a video call. Despite the signs of a bloodbath, Bert tells Marvin to proceed to the basement. Even though Marvin starts to have doubts as fear slowly fills his nerves, the mayor forces him to brave through it. Following the blood, Marvin arrives at the basement slaughterhouse, where he discovers the butchered bodies of Daryl, Kenny, and Ryan and shows them to his superiors. Bert then notices a freezer in the room and tells Marvin to check it out, ignoring that the officer is already scared. As Marvin slowly opens the freezer, Nikki suddenly sits upright, screaming. Unfortunately, this startles the frightened officer, so he ends up shooting Nikki in the head. Sheriff Hooper then tells Marvin to leave immediately, but Leatherface stops him and repeatedly hits him with an axe. Bert angrily tells Sheriff Hooper that they should finish what they started and burn the estate to kill the Sawyers once and for all. But Sheriff Hooper disagrees, still thinking they shouldn't have done that years ago. On the other hand, Heather realizes that Bert and his men are the bad guys. She immediately leaves the station, but not before writing murderers on the townspeople's picture taken after the travesty. Bert sees this and assumes that Heather is on the killer's side, but Sheriff Hooper tries to tell the mayor that Heather is probably just an unknowing victim. Heather goes to a phone booth and calls Farnsworth immediately to tell him about everything that happened. They meet up at a bar later, and Heather asks the lawyer why he didn't mention anything about Leatherface and her family's demise. So Farnsworth says everything is detailed in Verna's letter, which he assumed Heather has already read. He then proceeds to tell Heather that the man in the basement is her cousin, Jed Sawyer, a grown man who's mentally stunted. Farnsworth also says that Jed knows about the existence of a cousin, but doesn't know yet that it's Heather. Soon, Bert arrives at the bar and makes a beeline for Heather. Seeing this, Farnsworth tells her to take the table knife and run away. Then, as she escapes, Ollie runs her over with his car, so she slashes him with a knife before escaping again. While running in the streets, she comes across a police car driven by Carl. He then gives her a ride, and Heather tells him to stop for Farnsworth at the bar. However, as they pass by the bar, Carl drives past it and holds Heather against her will. As it turns out, Carl is Mayor Burt's son. Bert calls Carl and orders him to bring Heather to the town slaughterhouse. The mayor also calls Marvin, unaware he's dead. So instead, Leatherface is the one who hears the radio transmission. Meanwhile, Farnsworth goes to Sheriff Hooper to report what happened, and the sheriff realizes what Bert and Carl plan to do. Then, Sheriff Hooper leaves the station to follow them. As Carl arrives at the slaughterhouse, he ties Heather straight away before leaving to wait for his dad and Ollie. On the other hand, Leatherface gets to Heather first. He starts operating the chainsaw in front of her, but stops when he sees the Sawyer mark on Heather's chest, which she got the day the Sawyers died. Realizing that she's family, Leatherface starts setting her free, but Bert and Ollie arrive to attack the two surviving Sawyers. Although Heather manages to run away, she doesn't want to turn her back on Leatherface. Bert then chains Leatherface to the meat grinder and orders Ollie to turn it on. However, just as Ollie turns on the machine, Heather comes up behind and attacks him with a pitchfork. After that, Heather goes back to see Bert still attacking Leatherface, so she throws her cousin the chainsaw and lets him do his thing. Immediately, Leatherface attacks Bert with a chainsaw just as Sheriff Hooper arrives. The mayor shouts for the sheriff to shoot Leatherface, but he doesn't follow Bert's order. Instead, he lets Leatherface corner Bert into the meat grinder. Then, before leaving, Sheriff Hooper tells Heather to clean up their mess. 
together, Leatherface and Heather walk back to the mansion, where she tries to touch his face while wiping it. However, he stops her and just walks back to his basement. Afterward, Heather finally reads Verna's letter, which tells her all about herself and Leatherface. Although Verna gives her the option of leaving, Heather decides to stay and care for her cousin. In the post credit scene, Heather's foster parents visit her at the mansion, hoping to reconcile with her after learning about her inherited fortune. However, Leatherface is the one who greets them at the door, wielding a chainsaw. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications and leave a like it really helps the channel out. Thank you for watching.